very excited about uh, what could be really an advance in the field of mechanical ventilation because of the physiological background, but also because of uh, the clinical aspect, which I think is uh, also very interesting with these modes. So I'm working with a number of companies and, and specifically with Covidien on uh, this uh, technique of PATH Plus and for instance for trying to put uh, uh, a trial together as mentioned by Karen previously. So I'm living in Toronto, Canada and I'm very proud to be in a country which invented the two most innovative modes of ve mechanical ventilation. Uh, and I just remind you that these two modes have not been invented by company, but by very smart physiologists. One from Winnipeg, and we saw him, and the other one uh, was uh, invented uh, in McGill in uh, Montreal. So these modes, and especially the one we are talking today, PAV, are proportional modes. Proportional means it gives pressure, so it's a pressure-targeted mode, in proportion to patient's effort. Uh, why do we need mode proportional? Because uh, Karen already described that, because it will give a much better synchrony with patient's effort, so it will determine the beginning and end of inspiration probably much better than other modes. It will adapt to change in demand, and Karen, for instance, show a very nice tracings of minute ventilation changing from time to time. The other modes are fixed settings, so they will not completely adapt, at least. And it may also, because the patient will choose the breathing pattern, uh, it may also allow the patient to determine the optimal tidal volume and frequency for lung protection, for instance. This is not something I'm going to talk about, but this is another possible exciting field. So you've seen this slide uh, already. You've uh, heard the discussion of uh, taking the screen and looking at the screen together. But, but again, this is the illustration. You, that's what you see on the ventilator. And if the gain of PAV is 50%, it means that 50% of the total pressure is made by the ventilator, so 50, the other 50% is made by the patient. So this is the first time that without any uh, device in the patient, you have directly or indirectly uh, what the patient is doing in terms of respiratory muscle activity. So what? Just wait a minute. So, okay, this is the, the terrible equation of motion, uh, but again, the equation of motion is just saying that for the respiratory system to have a given volume and a given flow, you need a total pressure, and this pressure can come from the respiratory muscles, can come from the ventilator, or can come from both altogether. And... Uh, the PAV is based simply on this equation, saying that we need the elastic work, so the elastic pressure, the resistive work, so the resistive pressure. Uh, and this can be separated into what the patient is doing and what the ventilator is doing. That's what PAV is doing. It's measuring volume and flow it's also calculating indirectly resistance and elastance. And so for any instant, at any instant of breathing, it can tell, well, the total pressure needed is this amount of centimeters of water. And as a ventilator, I am instructed to give only 50% of that. So the patient is doing the rest. Absolutely magic. It's it's, it's fantastic. How does the ventilator calculate resistance or estimate resistance and elastance? Another second magic thing, because with PAV, the ventilator is giving pressure while the patient is breathing, because remember, it, it, it measures the flow instantaneously. 
So when the patient stops breathing, the flow stops. Okay with that? So when the flow stops with PAV, and this is the only mode where you can have that, it means that the patient has finished inspiration. So then you can do an occlusion. You can do an occlusion perfectly at the end of inspiration. And this occlusion, even if it's short, it's 250 milliseconds, allows you to measure a plateau pressure, which is impossible to measure usually during assisted modes of ventilation. And this plateau pressure, even if it's not perfect, it's relatively short, gives you a very good estimate of the elastic pressure, so the elastance. And from that, you can also easily recalculate resistance. And so when you look at the, the tracing uh, of a patient under PAV, if you look carefully, you see this small uh, occlusion at end of insufflation with this small plateau pressure. It's every three, four, five breaths. And you see it on the screen. It's very small occlusion, so the patient does not really feel it. And it allows the ventilator to continuously calculate resistance and elastance. And it displays the value on the screen. Uh, you have this value here, the compliance, the resistance. And there have been no specific study looking at that, but uh, it could be useful for clinical monitoring. For instance, you have a patient under assisted ventilation. You don't know very well what's the mechanic of the patient. Well, this mode tells you during assisted ventilation what's the mechanics. So uh, this closed loop uh, technique, as described before, really makes the, the clinical use of this mode much easier than, than initially when clinicians were asked to manually uh, calculate resistance and compliance. Uh, what you will see if you have a patient on PAV, uh, maybe, maybe a lot of variability like here where you know, the pressure and flow uh, are, are, have a lot of variability. So you need to accept that, that it's patient's variability. And that, for instance, some of this variability simply due to the fact that patients had different needs at different moments. And uh, I'm not going to detail, but uh, there have been many studies looking at the addition of a load on the respiratory system and showing that this mode better adapt than others. And because the patient can be asleep or awake, can be uh, uh, hyperdynamic or hypodynamic, you have always this kind of variation. And these proportional modes are really designed for that. Uh, at the end, if you accept that, if you accept that uh, this vari variability is okay and that you do not control the volume and the rate, uh, is this mode easy, simple to use? Is it user-friendly? Uh, so this is a group. This co is coming from one center. So it's a single center study. They are using PAV all the time, and they made a comparison of uh, pressure support and PAV, looked at the number of uh, settings on the ventilator, the number of adjustment of sedation, and they found that uh, everything was, uh, there were clearly fewer manipulation of ventilator settings and change in sedative dosing compared to pressure support. So in an experience center, having accepted that uh, you do not control rate and volume and you have variability, they look very happy with that and they say, yes, it's very user friendly. So what, what clinical data do we have? Not so many, and uh, the, the reason I think we are nicely described by the historical perspective, uh, uh, which was described by Karen, uh, because it, take, it took a long time to, to have this mode available, and also it took a long time for the company to realize that uh, evaluation were needed. And this was uh, an evaluation by this group of Dimitris Georgopoulos, uh, done completely independent from the company. 
and they say, let's uh, randomize patient to pressure support or PAV, because this is pressure support is current practice in many centers. As soon as the patient is able to trigger, we switch to pressure support. And we like it because it offers uh, a, a, a supplemental degree of freedom compared to assist control, for instance. And PAV is another degree of freedom. And they say, let's look at synchrony. So I'm not going to show you the data, but the synchrony was far better. And let's look at uh, the number of patients who will stay for 48 hours on pressure support or PAV. Uh, so big study, 208 patients enrolled. The failure rate at 24 hours was uh, uh, twice. Uh, there was two times more patients who failed pressure support than patients who failed PAV. Only 10% only of the patients failed PAV, which means 90% of the patients very early on switched to PAV at 48 hours. They were still on PAV. Synchrony was much better. Uh, oh, yeah, this is the asynchrony index. You see almost, almost uh, zero. Uh, and that's it. They stopped the study at 48 hours. Very... Very attractive result, very good physiological data, and an interesting clinical outcome. Uh, Karen Bosma did not show that, but uh, she did a pilot study uh, in, in preparation of randomized trials. So it's, it's a small study. It's, uh, this is the number of patients enrolled in total. Uh, so you see... Um, um, the, the, the individual data for every patient. And uh, this is the way she displayed the result, which is interesting because in every patient, so each bar is one patient, uh, the blue part means uh, the ventilation before starting PAV or pressure support. So in the two arms. In red, this is the ventilation in PAV or in uh, pressure support. And in green, this is the time after extubation. And this is, again, a very small study to, to look at outcomes, really pilot study. But uh, you can see that, uh, uh, on average, it seems that there is less uh, prolonged duration of ventilation. You see, for instance, uh, clearly in the PAV group, a trend for less patients having uh, more than one or two weeks uh, uh, spent on the ventilator. And the Kaplan-Meier curve suggests a positive signal. So small study showing it's very, very feasible. Uh, the feasibility is, is at least as good as pressure support. And again, uh, a positive signal. Uh, the third clinical study is the one already briefly presented by Jordi about uh, our trial. We say maybe the, the, the last problem we have with PAV is how to set the gain, this, this percentage. Because it, once you have set FIU2 PIP, that's the only setting on the ventilator. And uh, the idea was that maybe we could try to look at uh, work of breathing. Uh, the ventilator is displaying a value of work of breathing. And we say maybe a normal value of work of breathing or effort could be interesting. We did not find that this value displayed by the ventilator was, was perfectly accurate. So I'm not going to show the data. Uh, and that maybe there was even something simpler, which was simply to look at the airway pressure. Because as we discussed in the beginning, if you look at the airway pressure, if you know the airway pressure and the gain, you know the muscular pressure. So it looks complicated, but it's just saying that the muscular pressure is based on the airway pressure minus PIP, so the delta pressure, uh, as a function of the gain on the ventilator. So because we know that uh, muscular pressure, normal one, should be on average below 5 and 10, well, we say we could, we could titrate directly the gain to have an airway pressure reflecting, mirroring, you said before, a, a muscular pressure between 5 and 10. So, so this was a kind of, of grid we had at the bedside, uh, this 
this big table, and you see, for instance, the ventilator, uh, the airway pressure on your ventilator is 15. Uh, your gain is 35, 35% of assistance. Well, this would mean you're, you're not in the good range. You're not between 5 and 10. So you have to increase the gain maybe to 50% to be in the good range. That's how it worked. The grid was not very good. So the next one is really high technology. So this is the one we hope to use for the clinical trial. Uh, but it's, it's really based on something very simple. You look at the airway pressure, you look at the gain, and you recalculate the PMUS, and you target the, the gain based on uh, these uh, normal values of effort. So we did a, an observational clinical study in five different centers, which were not used to have PAV, contrar by contrast to the, the Greek excuse group. Me, excuse right me, more. two minutes more. And uh, we found that uh, most patients tolerated PAV until extubation. To be on the safe side, every time there was some event, we switched back to assist control. But uh, for most of the patients, it was not related to the mode. And for the other patient, it was very easy to go uh, until extubation. The, the work of reading of the patient was as expected in the normal range. And overall, we were really uh, satisfied by the result. We were saying that many patients are at PAV until uh, extubation easily. We can reach the target in 85% of the case. And uh, it may be time now to do for a multi-center trial, uh, comparing PAV to PSV, enrolling the sufficient number of patients to really find a difference in uh, relevant outcome, like. Uh, ventilator free day of duration of ventilation. And we hope, uh, maybe not next year, but in two years, to come back with uh, the results. Thank you very much.